welcome friends to this monthly gathering we have as i have explained several times we meet every month so that we can renew our role as seekers active seekers on the path to our true home sachkhand this is uh, necessary to be frequently because our mind what it is it does not let us stay on track if we miss thinking about the path of the masters path of the sant math which we follow the mind takes us back into worldly activities and takes us into distractions and we sometimes forget what the primary role of a human being is why do we have human bodies is because this is the only opportunity we have out of 4 8.4 million species of life forms there is only one life form in which we have the capacity to seek because we feel we have the capacity to exercise free will and that is why it's a very great opportunity to be alive as human beings and get this opportunity so that is why it's necessary to be we call it satsang satsang is sat means the truth sat means company company of the truth the only true thing is our own reality our own self our totality of our own self the rest is all made up everything else is made up so when you want to have a satsang it means you are going to associate with the ultimate truth and that's why it's important to have satsang they said that in the spiritual path there are three elements one the seeker if there is no seeking there is no spiritual path to a perfect living master who while he is still a human being has access to the totality of consciousness the level which belongs to all of us the level which is our true home and such a human being already has access to that level and therefore he can guide us properly the third element is satsang a frequent association with the master amongst ourselves and therefore we should not miss any though of these three things if we want to attain uh, the ultimate experience of the truth and the truth is our own total self which includes everything uh, today i met an old friend of mine and i was very happy to see him when i came to the united states i came after retirement from my job in india and i came because great masters uh, uh, prophecy was that uh, the axis of spirituality will shift from the east to the west and he said this many times he told an american disciple of his dr julian johnson i heard him several times my with my own ears so i was thinking this is a great opportunity after retirement to do seva for my master uh, where the spirituality is going to move and he made it possible for me to come here which is very strange the circumstances in which i came were very strange when i came here the people who i met were already on the spiritual path and there were a few black guys in those days we called them negroes we can't use that word now no. but they were very good friends and one of them was an advanced satsangi who was already giving teachings of the great master and other masters of his line and therefore i was very happy to meet him and he helped me to compile the talks i was giving in book form he compiled them edited them and published them for me and he has been there thereafter doing a lot of work for the spiritual path i am very happy to tell you he is present amongst us today and he is known now as bhagwan ra africa at that time of course on the books you will see his original name leonard ingram i am very happy to introduce to you the presence here today of bhagwan ra africa mr leonard ingram will you rise please he has edited all those white books which you see and compiled them from my talks on love and reason and all those original books 
he's done that. So very happy to welcome him today and to honor his request to me to talk about the greatness of a perfect living master. He has said, that's what I should be talking. I agree. I agree because without a perfect living master, we have no recourse to anything. A perfect living master, like my master, great master, whose seva I am doing today. This is service to my master. I have not come here to teach anything. I am not a teacher. I have come here to share my experiences with the perfect living master, great master, Baba Sawal Singh. And those experiences are experiences of a simple seeker who wanted to know what is the truth. Does religion provide answers? Do other yogas provide answers? Who provides answers? I was born in a family where they were already following this master. Some people thought that's an advantage. That I am already born with a parents who follow this master and I grew up with that. For me it was a disadvantage. But then my mind was so strong thinking that I will not accept anything just because it's happened by accident and without my search. And therefore I said, I have a disadvantage that because my parents are following somebody, I'm beginning to follow the same person without any personal knowledge of what he is, what he is offering. When he offered something, I had to check it out with all other options available. So I spent about eight years, I still remember it, searching for everything. I got converted to different religions. I tried every possible type of yoga that was available at that time. I went into the mountains with yog yogis, tried everything. And only when I found that the teaching of the great master covered more area, took you further than any other method of meditation or yoga, then I accepted. And I still think that if I had not done that, I would be a blind believer in something. I don't believe in blind faith, nor did my master. He said, do not even accept the word of your own guru if you have not experienced something. And therefore, this whole exercise of discovering who you are is not based on blind faith of any kind. It does not require any assumption whatsoever except to assume what you are already experiencing. No other assumption at all. There are some experiences which we have and the proof lies in the experience for ourselves. I'll give you two examples of such an experience of a human being where the proof is carried by itself and nobody has ever challenged it. One experience is that we exist. Nobody has ever challenged. I've never found anybody saying, no, I'm not there, I don't exist. They, they say, we want to go into a state where we don't exist, but they don't deny that they're existing. Otherwise, they can't want to go anywhere. The fact that we exist is proven by the very experience of existence. And that is why this is something that we can say, yes, good starting point. Because we don't need any further proof. The rest must be proven. The another experience we all have which is self-proving and we don't need anybody else's proof. And that is the experience of waking up from sleep in the morning. We all go to sleep and we all wake up in the morning and nobody has ever said, am I awake? Let me pinch myself to see if I'm awake. Let me call a few witnesses to check out if I'm awake. What is the reason that when you wake up in the morning, you don't need any proof. What constitutes proof in the existence of that event itself? The, the proof is very simple. When we go to sleep, we become unaware of this physical body. And therefore, when we become unaware of the physical body, we become unaware of its experience in a physical world. And later on, we may have dreams and we have experience of a dream body 
and a dream world and no experience of a physical body and a physical world. When we wake up, we are sure we are awake. Not because when we open our eyes, not because we move our body. You can be lying completely still. When you wake up, something is happening, nothing to do with your movement of your body. Something is happening which tells you you are awake. Then you open your eyes, then you move. Wakefulness comes by itself. What makes you be so sure you are awake without even trying to prove nor asking anybody else for proof? The reason is, as soon as you wake up, you remember you have a physical body and you are in a physical world. It's that simple. The experience itself carries its evidence. Now, if this is true, that when you wake up in the morning from a dream state, from a sleep state, you have automatic evidence of wakefulness, wouldn't that be equally true if you woke up further from this wakeful state and have a higher wakefulness, and wouldn't you be equally convinced of it? There'll be no difference whatsoever. What makes us so certain that we are awake in the morning is a link back to the life we were leading here. We recall that we slept. We recall that we went to another state. If we do not recall, we cannot be sure of wakefulness. So it is the memory in consciousness that connects us to different levels of experiences. And the memory comes back. Yes, we slept. And therefore, we remember the whole world, remember what we have to do that morning, remember everything. It's a connection with that level of consciousness, that level of awareness that gives definite proof. These are the kind of proofs we need. If you want to be on a spiritual path and want to make progress, that's the kind of proof. Not just believing, oh, I think there is some state of higher wakefulness. I will one day do. Oh, I had a little out of body experience and looked like a sleep dream, lucid dream, something. That's not a proof. If you wake up, to a level where you remember what you were doing 100 years ago, 200 years ago, what different bodies you have had, what kind of dreams of wakefulness you have had, that proof will be so strong, <clears throat> there is no way to improve that proof. This spiritual path <clears throat> that I am talking of from a great master, a perfect living master, provides that kind of proof. He does not say, just believe. He said, don't believe. Just experience experience higher wakefulness. And if you awake, you remember you were there way before this body was born. You will remember your previous lives. You will remember these previous lives are merely dreamlike lives compared to the state of wakefulness to which you have woken up. The state of wakefulness is more awake than this. Just like this state is more awake than the dream state. Sometimes we have a dream in which we say, I know it's a dream. I think many of you have had those dreams. I've had many times. A dream in which I said, I know it's a dream. Who is saying that? I know it's a dream. I am saying it, but not in this body. I am saying it in a dream body. And I'm taking the dream body as real when I'm saying that. It's very difficult to pull away from the reality of an experience we are having when all other experiences are shut off. That's the beauty of this creation. The beauty of this creation is that we have capacity for several levels of consciousness and several levels of wakefulness. But only one exists at one time and that looks like the only reality. And now, right now, this looks like the only reality. We remember our dreams and we wake up. This is our reality. We haven't woken up any further. If we did, that will become the only reality. This will look like a dream. But when we come back here, this will look reality. That will look like a dream, even if it's a higher wakefulness. Because this whole design of the experiences of consciousness at different levels is so designed that we did not use the power of consciousness to be conscious of anything to create illusions. We use this power of consciousness to be conscious of anything to create realities. And the only way to make it reality was that when you have one set of experiences, others should be shut off. 
If all are there, nothing will be real, nothing will be unreal. Therefore, we have at one time only one level of reality. At this time, this is our level of reality. People have had higher wakefulness. And they can remember now, it looked more real than this. They can describe things which don't exist here. And yet they was wonder, was it a nice great dream or was it real? Because they returned to this reality. If we go to sleep again and remember and have the same dreams over and over again, we we'll still think the dreams are real. And we'll start to remember something that happened in a wakeful state. When did that happen? This is a beautiful way this reality has been created at all levels. So when we say there are levels of consciousness, we are talking of levels of reality created for us. Because there will be no fun in having a creation that looks unreal, like a shadow play. The principle of creation was to create levels of reality. And so we are mistaking any particular one level of reality as the only reality. In dreams, that is real. Wakefulness, this is real. Higher wakefulness, astral plane. What is the astral plane? That's the next level of wakefulness. The astral plane is nothing but the use of our sense perceptions without matter, without physical body. That's all. Sense perceptions are working in us now. They are the same sense perceptions that awaken and can function without needing a physical body. By the way, we are using those sense perceptions without physical body even now. When? When we imagine things. We can imagine we are outside, we are still here. But in the imagination, we can see, we can touch, taste, do everything that sense perception do here can be done through imagination. Many of you have attended my meditation workshops where we do experiment. Now you eat this thing, see flowers, see the smell. Not only people do that, they can remember the taste of the food, they remember the fragrance of flowers way afterwards when there were no flowers. All imagination. Imagination is not as imaginary as we think. Imagination is the power to use sense perceptions without the use of physical body. The physical organs do not create sense perceptions. And this is something that is coming to light even in science today, that sense perceptions are creating our entire experience of this reality. Sense perceptions create the experience of dreams. Sense perceptions can create the experience of a rational world. But there's a little difference. The laws that govern each experience is different. The laws that govern the physical experience, which we understand. Gravity. We are sitting in these chairs, we can't fly. Our bodies are too heavy for flying. It's a law of gravity, but doesn't apply to any other level except the physical level. In dreams, you can fly. In dreams, you can fall from a building and not get hurt. You can't do that here. In the astral plane, you can fly easily and not get hurt and don't need wings. The sense perceptions per se, per se can fly. <clears throat> Laws are different. Here, time flows only in one direction. At the speed which our clocks and our watches set, our experience may be different. We don't believe our experience. We believe the watches. I may be sitting with a friend and have a nice time and say, oh, two hours have passed. I thought it was only five minutes. And I'm moaning and groaning in bed pain and I say, why does the time pass? And five minutes look like two hours. And when I meditate, I want to meditate for two and a half hours and it looks like two and a half hours. Ten minutes? How can that be? This time we are experiencing is so different from the time we believe in. It's amazing that we don't believe our experience, we believe in an artificial thing that is made outside of ourselves. But it's a law of this state of existence, physical law that time flows. <clears throat> time here flows only in one direction. A question that is bothering all these professors, big professors of physics are discussing this today. Why does time flow only in one direction when Einsteinian philosophy accepted by science says that time space is just one unit? That time is merely an ordinator space. It's just one of the dimensions. Then in space we can go 
forward and backwards. Why can't we do that in time? If time is an ordinate of space, it should be possible. And they have a, such a big problem. Recently, a paper has come up saying there are some atoms that are not spherical. Most of the atoms are spherical. They found some atoms like pear-shaped. And the shape of the pear is in one direction. They said that is controlling the experience of time flowing in one direction. It's just a hypothesis just come up recently. But they can't understand it. Now, when you go to the astral plane, the sensory perceptions can move in both directions. And forward and backwards. And they prove their space-time is actually what we think space-time should be here. And space-time is there also. The rules that govern our experiences in different realities are different. You go to still higher level. Another wakefulness. And that wakefulness does not take place with this body. And many people try to read causal plane, the plane of the mind, by meditating in this body. How can you reach there? When you reach the astral plane, which comes prior to the causal plane, you cannot use this body anymore. You are unconscious of it. It's just like saying, I went into a dream state and I had a nice body there. I look younger than I was. And I want to now meditate higher in that body. You can't do it. You left it behind. It was a dream. You have to now do your meditation with this body. Similarly, people make a big mistake of trying to stay in this body, even trying to have an experience beyond the astral plane, nobody's ever done it. If you want to have an experience in a higher wakeful state, use the body of the higher wakeful state. And that's the body of sense perceptions, no connection with the physical world. If you do that, you can wake to a higher state. In the higher state, the laws are totally different. The laws are that you see the building blocks of all creation in the lower states of dreams, wakeful state, astral state, you can see all the laws operating. The building blocks of those which are what are creating space-time experiences. And you can see colors, you can see ratios, proportions, numbers as living entities there which are creating this and that's such a big difference in the experience there. But you can have that experience if you meditate with the sensory astral body. And people, some people do it, not many. But this is all looking at the different realities we have created in space-time continuums. This reality is in space-time. Dreams are in space-time. Astral plane is in space-time. Causal plane is in space-time. And we don't belong to space-time. We belong to that area of consciousness where space-time was created. That state in which we are is actually our state as individual souls. We talk of Atma soul, that we are Atma, we are soul. But we never know what the soul is. No experience of soul. We're looking at these experiences that created three universes and say whoever is having it in whichever body is the soul. People even talk of transmigration, my soul went from one to another. Soul never travels. Soul never moves. Soul is not in time-space. Time-space is created around the soul for experience. Yet, when the astral body moves from one physical body to another, that is reincarnation. But no soul movement is involved. Understanding the soul is beyond the mind. Experiencing the soul is within human consciousness, beyond the mind. People think with their mind they can understand who they are. No, it's not possible. The reason is, our true reality, our soul is beyond mind, beyond space-time, and the mind only works in space-time. The mind cannot function. The mind's functioning is basically through thinking. Thinking, analyzing, putting things together, using logic, deductive and inductive, and putting things together and coming to conclusions. All this, every step of it requires time and space. But where there is no time space, how can the mind reach that? And we are all trying very hard to use the mind to understand who we are. We can't do that. The problem is complicated because we have not distinguished ourselves as consciousness from one of the instruments we are using for this experience, the mind. We are mixing up 
द सोल आवर रियलिटी विद द माइंड विच इज अ थिंकिंग मशीन वी नॉट डिस्टिंग्विशिंग बिटवीन द टू ऑल दो वी आर यूजिंग बोथ एट ऑल टाइम्स इवन इन दिस लाइफ even at physical level even dream level even causal and astral levels we are using our soul if we don't have a soul we won't be conscious we'll be dead life is being created by our true reality and we don't know what the reality is and we can't find out because we try to find out everything with the mind we find out it's like a computer mind is like a computer you having a computer and telling the computer you tell us who i am computer limitations mind has limitations of time and space so that is why to be able to rise awaken i can't even call it awaken awakening is in time space how would i describe somebody who says i have realized who i am i have found the self how can the experience of the self be explained at all i don't think there are any words i know and yet we talk of it every day we try to describe it in physical terms you get up this a huge place there well, of course without time and space huge place so many souls dancing there in true home so much happening these are physical stories we have to make stories just to be an incentive for trying to find out what's going on these stories that all the masters are telling us are not a description of anything beyond the mind they are made up by the mind used by the mind and used as an incentive to move on when you awake to the state there is no way to use the mind and if you have no mind to use and you are con- confused even of who you are beside the mind how can you go beyond what are those functions which our soul is performing at all times even when we are in a physical body if you can identify those that will be the key of how to go beyond the mind there are three functions that the soul performs which the mind cannot one the experience of love the experience of love cannot be created by thinking it just happens when it happens you can't connect it with time and space the experience of love is unique it's a spiritual experience coming only from the soul intuition sudden knowing something suddenly without time space experience of the soul intuition intuitive knowledge spiritual experience of the spirit of the soul appreciation of beauty spiritual experience you can't uh, say this is beautiful because of mind is saying i look at these flowers beautiful and then i say how did i call them beautiful Look at them. Oh, this color, that color, and the more I analyze with the mind, the beauty disappears. It does not enhance. Analysis has never given us the experience of beauty. Synthesis, oneness, is given. There are certain experiences, spiritual of the soul, taking place along with the experiences of the mind. Mind thinks, mind rationalizes, mind makes sense of things, mind puts things together, and soul does those things too. Both are happening at the same time. therefore if you want to transcend the mind there is no mental effort that can do it no meditation can do it people talk of i did meditation i reached my true home meditation is a mental exercise all meditation in the world is mental exercise how can a mental thing do something to take you beyond mental therefore what can take you beyond is love intuition beauty these take you beyond how do you experience them today all our experiences are based upon the use of the single part of consciousness called attention we put attention on something and that becomes our experience if we don't put any attention that's lost when you use attention it's a mental attention therefore you can cannot with mental attention of any kind including in meditation go beyond the mind all those experiences people have recorded with meditations of all kinds yoga of all kinds stop at the universal mind at the causal plane none have ever gone beyond because the mind is involved to go beyond it must be the same experience 
which we experience here somebody loves you you are pulled by that love you can't explain what happened your mind tries to get confused what is happening to me especially if the power of the love is very strong and you can't help it the mind says no but you still want to go mind says no you still want to go what kind of stuff is that when you have that experience what is pulling you a spiritual experience now i want to refer to the request that my friend bhagwan ra africa made i should talk about the teachings of perfect living masters is not a teaching their power consists of the power of love that's what pulls us they pull us with their love here they pull us with their love in the astral plane they pull us with their love in the causal plane they pull us our love beyond the mind that is how they operate that means even as human beings like ourselves we are just seekers they come as human beings and what is the difference that their awareness their consciousness has transcended our mental barriers and their love comes from beyond the mind and therefore it pulls us here pulls us in the astral plane pulls us causal pulls us beyond the mind and reveals to us our soul they work from soul to soul they don't come to pull our mind there are plenty of activities going on to pull your mind here they don't join that party that all right we'll also teach you something and come and see how nice we can present something not at all they tell stories because we want to listen to stories only reason why they tell stories is we like stories not that they had need, the stories are needed for going anywhere nothing is needed for love love is a pull a force they are that love personified they are love of that kind which pulls and their experience love leads to that experience of intuitive knowledge and beauty that lies beyond the mind our experience of our own true self is discovered through that kind of a love and what happens if we transcend the mind which is their path great master said baba sawan singh he said the path from this physical state of seeking up to the top of the three worlds of astral physical causal is a path that lot of people follow that's not my path my path start from beyond that what we call par brahm where the soul experiences itself without the mind my path starts from there and goes to such khand where you discover there is only one soul the individuation is also an illusion and creation that's his path so what happens when we cross the spiritual region of oneness we discover the soul is beyond time space and it's just a unit of consciousness the next step is to discover that it's not a unit of consciousness it is part of consciousness it's part of single consciousness totality of consciousness now imagine in true home we say we are all one some people are bothered by that i got a letter yesterday from a friend of mine that i have very carefully listened to what you are saying carefully listen to all these masters they say that at the highest stage there is only oneness he said what a terrible thing to go and experience oneness here are friends here i have a good time here and i lose all this to become one and become solitary and alone what kind of game is this there is no way to describe that oneness the word oneness is wrong because oneness implies in our mental uh, understanding the many is no one and the many are one that's not true it's not one it's totality this experience is also happening there every experience is happening there the discovery that all experiences were created right there that's totality so when you have that level of awareness it's not that you are giving up any other level of awareness you are finding out the truth of all creation there's no description for that but when we are not there every other level of awareness we go through is only one reality there there is total reality total illusion total consciousness the whole thing has been created there nothing is missing there 
you can't say i'm leaving this year and going there there is no there or here it's total nothing is outside of it including what we are doing and sitting here so we don't miss anything at all we just discover the whole range of beautiful experiences the whole range of creation taking place and we discover that our own true self the totality of consciousness is the creative power that can create all this including all levels of consciousness people have experiences i have met people who have been to different levels of awareness and they gone pretty high and they gave descriptions of them each one of them describes a wakefulness into that state by forgetting the other states so that means at one point you can only have one reality except at the end at the end you have all realities and all illusions at the same time there is very big difference between parbrahm where we discover the soul and sachkhand with its totality very big difference in parbrahm you are still aware of only one there i am the soul the rest was created from here there you discover everything is created from there nothing was outside at all it's not that this some people think there is some home of ours called sachkhand and we have to leave this place to go there and not at all if that is total nothing can be outside of it in fact that was one of the big problems i had as a child seeking the truth because they were telling me that the spiritual path consists of rejoining to our true home after being separated for a long time that was the whole presentation being made they even went that far to say that our true home is like an ocean and we are drops of that ocean and we have left the ocean and have been roaming around for millions of years all alone here and now the job of our spiritual path the job is to work hard meditate follow rules and ultimately gradually gradually stage by stage you go and reach the ocean and merge in it as a description given of a spiritual path and i said to myself i am a drop of water beautiful drop because the sun shines on me i make rainbow colors i have designs on me and i can see other drops i have a great variety of experiences they are telling me lose all this give up all this and go and merge in an ocean an ocean doesn't care one more drop falls into it it's the biggest lose lose game in the world you lose what you have and the where you join you get nothing i could not understand why are people encouraging a spiritual path if this is what it is but this is totally wrong i was wrong the presentation was wrong this is not true that we are drop that separated from the ocean if one drop had separated from the ocean it could no longer be called total ocean we were never separated the ocean never lost any drop all the drops are in the ocean what is the ocean except so many drops what is the size of those drops are they small or big drops now that is the key what is the size of a drop of water still sitting in an ocean why ocean let's take this little cup this cup glass of water these are drops all put together what's the if i want to look at it as the whole cup of water yes this is a glass of water now i want to see the drops in it and i can see the drops you can see i can see so many drops all filling it up what's the size of the drop created by my awareness i can look at it small drops i can look at bigger aware drops therefore it then occurred to me that this whole spiritual path is not about leaving anything and going anywhere it's a question of regaining our awareness of the totality of our ocean and this contraction to a drop size of a human physical being is merely an experience in the total ocean in the totality of such kind somebody says how far away is such kind i said we are right now there they said what are we doing for there what is the purpose of a journey there is no journey the truth is there's a state of wakefulness rising to that level and because we are so identified 
with our minds. We do not think a difference. I think, therefore I am. It's totally incorrect. I am. I have a mind that thinks, therefore I think. It's correct. I'm not there because of the mind. It's a thinking machine. I'm there because I'm conscious. Consciousness is my reality, not thinking. Thinking is a function. So this is the mix up by which we cannot do anything on our own. Thank God, there are human beings sitting in this world and those human beings have an awareness of the total and yet they have awareness of being with us here. They look upon us as part of themselves. They see the whole picture. They see the drama created for creation and they participate in the drama. And when we seek, it's merely that drama of being individuated coming into play to make total. What I'm saying actually is that perfect living masters are actually your own self. Because they know their self. Your own self which you discover at the end is the only self. It's totality of all selves. And that is why imagine the beauty. Imagine the beauty of a person who sits as an ordinary human being. Totally ordinary, sometimes more ordinary than ordinary people. And yet is carrying that awareness of totality. And to have a presence of that person, what happens to us? A strange feeling. We all have strange feelings when we are in the presence of such a person. Of course, feelings differ depending upon what we are seeking. And if we are seeking the truth and we are seekers of the ultimate, feelings are different. We are so pulled by the presence of such a person. This is the greatness that an ordinary human being can be just sitting with us and we, we say nothing. Do you know how many times people like me went through great master? We have a lot of questions to ask and we sit near him and couldn't even think of the questions that we had. He's so affected. What is this? So we're looking at him. What is pulling us? Is this white beard? Is this his eyes? Is his smile? How can an old man with a white beard, and he was at the last part of his life, he's died at about 90 years old. At that old age, this old man is sitting there. People are sitting there looking at him and wondering what's going on to them. This is the, it is not, nothing is happening with the physical bodies. Nothing is happening with the minds. Nothing is happening with thoughts. Thoughts are being held back for a moment in the presence of such a person. Afterward, we take everything back. What happened to me? I couldn't ask my questions. What happened to me at that time? What happened is the presence of a human being of that time, who, when he's sitting with us, is carrying the totality of consciousness as part of his awareness. It's a unique experience. So these perfect living masters, they are very ordinary as human beings and very extraordinary in their consciousness. And what affects us is the consciousness because it's a communication between soul to soul. It's not communication with mind and mind. All our other communication in this world are mind to mind. And this is one communication, soul to soul. We can sit with the perfect living master, with the perfect guru, and do nothing and come so much enlightened the world with something. So much progress. One of the great saints of the past, Kabir, in India, he says, if you can spend one ghadi, ghadi, was mean an hour and a half almost, if you can spend an hour and a half in the, with a perfect living master, or half of it, or even half of that, now imagine what we're talking of. That's more valuable than 1,000 years of meditation. Of course, there's an exaggeration, I can understand that. But the real reason for exaggeration is to show you the importance of the physical presence of a perfect living master and our ability to be in the presence of such a human being. Where, where can you find these human beings? 
such great masters where can you find them maybe they came long ago and don't come in this age at all why why is the reason what's the reason that they should be here at all they are human beings with an experience of totality why should they be here amongst us what is the reason that we can say yes we found a perfect living master why should they be here they are not here because they want to be here they are here because we need them who needs them here only a seeker of the ultimate truth nobody else nobody else needs them now if there is a seeker a human being with the seeking that i have had enough of the experience of creation want to go back to my true home and be who i really am if there is a seeker thinking like that what will happen a seeker begin to think like that and his seeking has to lead somewhere his seeking will lead to where he seeks everybody who seeks anything ultimately defines what they seek if they th- seek positively there is a book called the secret i read it says it depends on what you think and believe in if you believe you will get something and you believe it's already there you will get it and they give to- a lot of examples it's not a new it's not a new secret that revealed by the book it's been revealed for thousands of years we have heard about them earlier i love one of the great um, shabds of the uh, granth sahib which says jo mange thakur apne the soi soi deve same theme same theme has been expressed to the greeks same theme has been expressed to the earlier documents that your own positive thinking leads to positive results negative thinking brings negativity to you it's an old theory old accepted experience of people when a seeker is seeking something he will attract these perfect living masters only appear at the right time when the seeking of a seeker for the ultimate truth this is the point where he says i am ready to go they appear how do they appear because they are, they are totality of consciousness they can appear anywhere they appear but they follow the rules the laws of the place where they appear if they appear in a physical world they follow the law of physical world that there must be some reason why a certain person comes up to our life and very often the reason why they appear in our life here is very simple is called a coincidence these coincidences are very strange i have noticed when a person wants something strongly and believes in it coincidence happens and that thing happens so coincidence is what is a coincidence a coincidence is the happening of an event or two events put together two things are put together against the laws of probability what was not probability happens that's a coincidence they appear in our life seeker is already searching and they appear at the right time as ordinary persons but they move the seeker seeker gets a feeling i think i was waiting for this i think this is the time i was waiting for they get strange feelings these people appear now i can tell you another very interesting part of it and that is which also bothered me when i was very young that is how does the law of karma operate because we say we don't meet anybody in this world except through our past karma do we have karma with these masters how do we meet them and more tantalizing thought was if i have karma with 1000 people in this life i am reborn and then i have to reach out all those people they have karma with 1000 more people what kind of computer te- technology is that guy using who determining where to be born so you can satisfy all those different relationships you had it's a very tough job here with six numbers there are millions that who uh, buy the lottery and only one or two sometimes gets it and these are thousands of connections thousands of connections with thousands of millions of people how can you work out a karma that the next life they will all meet those people who they connected with whoever is doing this job 
must be having super computers with him. But I thought so difficult to even rearrange lives like that. How does the reincarnation operate? How does this karma carry forward? The answer I found to this question was very different from what I was thinking. The answer was that the entire experience we create is from our own mind. There's nobody else. The whole, if there's only one consciousness creating everything, and that consciousness in the causal plane operates through a universal mind, everything that's created is from that single source. Therefore, when we see many people, we say there are many people. That's your experience. There are not many people. There's only one. Yourself. Having experience of many people. When you're reborn, you create another set of many people with the same karma. It's only one person's karma that's required to be adjusted. And you meet the same people according to your own creation. It's just like a dream. Supposing we have a dream and we meet 20 people in the dream. And we say, now we'll meet again. And where will we meet? Oh, we'll have to decide. We'll telegram. We'll do this thing. We'll telephone. We'll make. Then I woke, wake up. Next day I sleep again. We meet. None of them telephoned. And none of them did anything. Because it was one dreamer. Twenty were part of one dreamer. The billions are part of one dreamer. If this whole creation is dreamlike, it is not necessary. Therefore, that's for the real answer I got. That when we say there are so many people, they are a creation for that. They have become reality for that particular life. They are no reality otherwise in any experience. They are created. So therefore, you can recreate the people as required for your karma, one person's karma. And the whole thing is, and therefore it's so easy to fit in a perfect living master in the right place. This was a very good answer I found after studying what happens at the causal plane. If you go study at the causal plane, you find exactly that's how we create all experiences at all levels. So this was very interesting. But sitting here in the physical reality, it does look like a coincidence that when you are ready, such a person comes into your life. You cannot find such a person. You could find him if he looked different from us. If there were some qualifications saying he'll be that different. He's not different from us. He's born like us, dies like us, eats food like us, and lives life like us, has karma like us. How is he different? He's the same person. There's no difference as a human being in a human body. His body is not different. Some people think he's here because he has no karma. You can't be here without karma. That's the law of this physical universe. He's totally like us. Then what makes him perfect to master is only the level of his awareness and the power of his love which pulls us. He has come specifically in our life at that time because we as seekers are ready to go home. The only requirement to find a perfect living master is to seek for the ultimate. You seek the ultimate perfect living master will arrive in your life. You might think at that time, I have found one. You have not found it. The master has found you. And you think, I found because that's how the mind works. I found something. Supposing there's a group of blind people locked up in a room and the walls of the room are flush and they don't know where the door is because the door opens at one point which is flush with the wall. They go around with their hands, blind people. We want to find the door to get out. And they're all moving their hands along the walls. They can't find the door. Suddenly a man who is not blind walks in. They all scream. Somebody has come. He might know where the door is. And the man watches these blind people going round and round trying to find the door. And he finds one is really anxious to find the door. And he goes and holds his hand. He says, come on, I'll take you out. He says, I found. He'll never say he found me. He's blind. He doesn't know he could not have found. The man with eyes found him. But when the man gave his hand, he says, I found the man with eyes. That's how we say. We found a perfect living master. There's no way we can find one. Only a perfect living master can find us. And the only qualification required for him to appear and find us is our 
seeking for the ultimate. Seek as you will find. Seeking is the secret. No amount of other worshipping, no amount of other rituals counts. Seeking inside you. Seeking intuitively. Seeking with your heart and soul. That seeking is the only requirement. If you seek like that, perfectly the master will appear at the right time. Now, when I say right time, some people ask me, what is the right time? They say, we, our right time is ASAP. I don't know what that means. A ASAP is our right time. No, right time is when you are seeking for the ultimate overrides your seeking for pleasures and distractions of this world. It's just a question of how you balance it. You seek more of this world, he waits. Okay, do what you are doing. He said, no, this is not it. This is not my world. This is, I'm tired of it. I'm fed up of it. He appears and takes you home. There's no way to describe the beauty of such a perfect living master. But they appear in our life when we are ready. And I am sharing all these things with you. I don't come here to teach anything because I am not a teacher. I taught once at college, but they're teaching English literature and poetry and all. But this is not teaching. This is telling you, sharing with you, that I once came upon a perfect living master. And I thought I had come upon that perfect living master once upon a time. No. He is with me at all times. That's the beauty of this relationship. Once a perfect living master accepts you, you are with him forever. And forever doesn't mean this physical level forever in time, space and beyond. That's the beauty of it. I'm very happy you came for this monthly meeting and I got the opportunity to share this. And I'm very grateful to Bhagwan Ra Africa for suggesting I say a few words about the perfect living master. We'll have a break. Uh, I'll see you at about 3.30 again.